So, I don't know. You got in a car wreck yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. You know, it's one of those, like, when you do a good deed and no good deed goes unpunished um, type thing. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, you're ready to go home, and then you remember, oh, I, I forgot these cans for our, our table ministry in the back of my car. And so, yeah, I, just a little bit of a blind spot, little uh, accident that happened. So. We do not have any live viewers yet, and I'm getting some error messages. So We have one live viewer. Woo! Oh, we have two. Okay, here we go. All right, it's going. So it just takes a few minutes. Yeah. What's um, that candle over there? It looks like a Target candle. Well, can you tell that I like Target? Like I can pick out what. It's White <laughs> Barn. Target. Lemon yeah. Mint Lake. So it's not this time of year, but it's yeah. it's a prop at this point. I have a little candle wax melter, and it's green because I have like some kind of Christmas thing in it. Yeah. Nice. But I can't I can't smell anything right now because it's a week old. And is it on? It's just yeah. it's really cold in here. There's no heat in my office. Yeah. As you can tell. So on Sunday, I had these candles up for, for church, and at the very end of the church service, I went, I had my mask on, and I went and tried to blow them out, and I was like, how stupid, like, you have a mask on, you can't blow, blow out the candles, <laughs> and on the table there was sitting a little snuffer, and I'm like, <laughs> you could have used that? <laughs> yeah. So here I am, like, going into the action. Well, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Table Talk. My name is Michael Scott, and today we have a guest with us, and so this is Abby Papar. Hello. I call her Papar, but that's not her real yeah, name. Yeah, last name Pepper. Yeah. You can make all the jokes you want. Salt and Pepper, Dr. Pepper. Yeah, I got white salt, right? Yeah. Salt and Pepper. Like we can, we can, yeah. We're salt and, we're salt and Pepper today. Yeah. Yeah, we are. That's amazing. Like Abby it. is our Raytown campus pastor, so those of you that watch us, um, we have three campuses, Lee Summit, Raytown, and here in Blue Springs, and so she uh, is our Raytown campus pastor, and um, the last two weeks, we specifically chose people with red hair to come, because we had Brian last week, right? Oh, yeah, nice. <laughs> so really, it's just it's the other pastors at our other venues, um, but Abby's nice enough to come join us today, so yeah, thank you thank for being here. And thank you for having me, and I chose to wear a vest today, because I know Michael likes to wear vests, I like vests. so, you know, <laughs> matching up. And it's black, too, like, it's even yeah. the same color. If you'd have told me, I'd wear a gray shirt, a gray oh, t-shirt underneath it. We, I, we didn't plan that much. Yeah, not, not good enough. <laughs> so, um, this week was our last week. You preached this week, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. so you preached on this subject as well, and... and uh, I'm not sure if we did the exact same thing, but probably something similar. So, what did you talk about this I week? I preached a little bit different. I, I preached about um, the banquet that Jesus was at where he talked about another banquet. So, the, the parable of the great banquet where, like, the host invites all these people and they make all these dumb excuses. They're too busy. They're too busy. Yeah. And so, then he sends out a servant to go collect all these other people. The riffraff. Um, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, just like, who's at your table? Who's on your guest Ooh, list type that's thing. That's good. I like so, that. It was a fun... This series is fun. I love it. Oh, it's it. been so good. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. So if you didn't get to see, or if you don't go to our church necessarily, maybe you watch this um, and you don't go to church with us, but we've been talking about the table, right? This well, Actually, this what we do on Tuesday is called Table Talk because I believe that relationships are formed, real life happens around tables, whether that's uh, at home. We invite people to start at home, the, 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 to reclaim the table at home, to actually have family dinners at a table because we don't anymore. Uh, and then at the office, and then I said last week in the community, and we try like what we're trying to do is encourage small groups, and especially right now that looks probably way more digital than it you know uh, than in person. Um, and I just I made the argument that when Jesus fed the five thousand, it's very specific when we read on, on the accounts that he broke them into smaller groups. And I think there was some intention behind that, not just how he served them, but that there was intention behind it. There's 5,000 people. Well, 5,000 people can't talk and have a conversation. No. <laughs> but in a smaller group, you know, and I think that most of them say 50-ish, you know, Clara. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luther, John, yeah. trying to remember how many. But the, the point is he broke them into smaller groups to have conversations. And I think... Um, that Jesus was a smart guy, Abby. Yeah, I think so too. And I think he probably knew that there were like introverts in the room. Like they need this smaller group because like I'm an introvert. I know you're an extrovert. Right. And so it's like when there's that many people, it's hard to like find a way that you can connect with everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I told this story, this analogy that I heard. That was a different context, but I'd heard this from somebody else. Uh, I, I modified it a little bit to talk about... Um, 
this analogy of the difference between a sports bar like a country bar or an Irish bar or, you know, whatever, you know. And so the analogy was at a sports bar, you know, you're there and you're rooting for your team or whatever. And there's not a lot of conversation. It's more about the rivalry yep, absolutely. and tribalism, which I'm against. Right. Uh, and anyway, so that's and it's loud and noisy as compared. And so when you go there, um, you know, people go to bars to deal with their problems. Right. And. <laughs> I, I kind of told a little bit of a joke that, you know, drinking is the solution to your problem. It's not the best solution, but right. it, it's part of it. So when you go to a sports bar, you drink and, and your team wins and that's fun. But when you wake up the next day, you still have all your problems. And I said, as compared to like a country bar, at a country bar, there's some, you know, there's some <laughs> musician or, or whatever, you know, where there's a musician in the corner. And I made the joke that, you know, country music, you lose your dog in your house and your truck and your car and all the things. You left off the tractor part. The like, tractor, yes. Your tractor goes down and you have to repair your tractor. Because she thinks it's sexy, right? And so, for all you country music fans out there, um, you grew up in a small town, right? Uh, Jeff City. I mean, well, it's not really small. There was rural parts around it. Like, okay. if you went in the back way to my house, like, subdivision, you were in the, in the rural area. So, it's okay. kind of. Kind of. Uh, and so I, and so I made the argument that at a country bar, it's about, you know, the guy's singing sad songs, but you're sitting there and you're having a conversation and you're talking and you're still drinking, you know, you're still hanging out, but then, uh, you're actually working through some of your problems that like a, a bar is just a small group of type setting, right? And maybe you wake up the next day and maybe, maybe it's not as bad, right? Maybe you've worked through some of it. You've been able to process it. And so, um, so yeah, I linked to the church <laughs> to Dude, I like it into that. Did you, did you listen? I thought that was a very interesting like connection. Like I had never thought about that. Yeah. But like, yes, like that happens. And I, I kind of want like a happy medium between right. the two versions. Because I want it to be loud enough that people aren't listening to my like problems. <laughs> but like it's like quiet enough that I can have that intimate conversation with whoever I'm with. Right. But yeah, like Sometimes, though, I get distracted by by the sports on there. Like, if it's a soccer game, like, I'm a big uh, Sporting KC fan uh -huh. or a Chiefs fan. The real football. Yeah. It's soccer, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the universal football. That's yes, the... <laughs> absolutely. But, yeah, I think there's tons of ways that you can connect and have community in those that is ways that you can't in a church when you can't have those conversations. Because otherwise, it's like, hey, I'm trying to listen to Michael right now. <laughs> well, and then in church... Like, they didn't, so you can see how church becomes consumeristic, yep. right? Because if your expectation is my problems will be fixed because some preacher says some words, mm -hmm. that's not, you know, that's not why we exist. We exist to build transforming communities. Mm -hmm. Now, church is one of them, but uh, often people will come and maybe they feel inspired by the music or maybe it's, and whoever's preaching that week. But you go home and you solve your problems as compared to maybe you hear something that inspires you, but then you do something about it and you work that out in your small groups or your family or whatever that is. And I think in the church world, we're missing that part. Um, we've become a culture that just wants to consume church and um, in all, <laughs> what is that? Y'all can't see this, but there's a fly dying on the table. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there he goes. He's kind of flying. Like break dancing. Like yeah, good spinning. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was awkward because we both heard it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the church becomes this thing where we get drunk on the sermon or the music or whatever. And we wake up the next day and we solve the same problems. And that realization happens. And so that newness wears off. And so there's certain people that I call church hoppers, right? Mm, yeah. And Christians are notorious for this. We just trade from church to church to church or denomination to denomination. We never work on self. We never work through the problems. Never, never... go deep. No, oh, ever. You just go until yeah. you... Well, if somebody asks you to go deep, sometimes you don't want to. Yeah. Because that's been, been the experience in church. And so then, yeah, I'm going to hop around until these people don't know me enough. And what I find is the fight, flight, or freeze yep. pops in the second that you try to engage that deepness, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, not always. I'm just saying, in, I'm generalizing some yep. things here. And when people experience that, they run to the next church or they freeze, you know, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, or they, you know, they get visceral with me, they have a reaction like, no, no, you know. And so, uh, so I, I really wanted people to look inside, you know, and say, you know, how do we see faith? How do we see community? And it has to be more. Uh, and I've said this since we've started this church, it has to be more than Sunday mornings. Yes, absolutely. We don't hang our hats on something. That's one of many things that we do. And so uh, if you're a person watching today that's not a church person, or if you're a church person, I hope you hear from us that, uh, as two pastors, yes. right, 
that um, there's more to faith than the Sunday morning experience. Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely say, like, if I look back at my entire experience, even before I was in ministry, that, like, the most growth I ever happened happened around tables, around coffee uh, shop tables, or out with friends, mm -hmm. like, um, in those restaurant settings, things like that, like, beyond a Sunday morning. Because, yeah, I can listen to the pastor and, and get something out of that 20-minute sermon, um, but until I start dialoguing it and, mm -hmm. um, and talking through it and thinking through it, you know, it doesn't do anything beyond just Sunday. Until those words become flesh, mm -hmm. right? That's the analogy John uses, right? Yeah, absolutely. Until we can live out, or it's the same with communion, uh, that we talk about this, this weird thing called bread and wine. It's, it's like Jesus' body and blood. But until we consume those and eat those and they become part of who we are and it lives out in us, it makes no sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, it's, it's for nothing, really. Right. So all those who are watching, I know we get some comments here. What, do you, what does church mean to you? Do you see church as a Sunday morning experience? Or do you see church and community and faith as something that's lived out through a small group? Um, or, and what does that mean to you? Or what would you like to see in a small group? I, I'll, I'll pose that question. Amy will look for responses, and we'll come back to that. Um, so for you, let's go back to your sermon. So you talked about... So I want to talk about that because uh, we have this tendency to, maybe we have small groups. Mm -hmm. So part of my challenge Sunday was, even if you have a small group of people, often what happens in a small group is it's people who look like us, right? It's, 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 for me, it's white middle-aged men, right? So I mean, for you, it's, that's going to be different. But so what does that look like to branch outside of ourselves? So I think that probably plays into your sermon. So tell yeah. us more about that. Absolutely. So I kind of basically talked about how God's table is a lot bigger than we can even imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to go beyond who you are and who you normally hang out with. And that's hard because we're most comfortable with the people that we mm -hmm. know. Um, but it's the people that we don't know that we're uncomfortable with. That in that uncomfortableness is where we grow. Right. And so it takes intentional effort to do that. And like right now, it's super hard to do that. Like so hard. Uh, so hard to do that. But um, I talked about how God's guest list is totally different than who we think of. Um, it's the people who can't repay you. It's the people that you know when we usually have people over to our house or whatnot. We kind of have this kind of expectation like oh. The, the Joneses are going to invite me over in a couple months. Like, we're, we're going to have this kind of back and forth type thing. But in this parable, it kind of talks about how um, you invite people who need that meal, you need that community, um, and, and you include them. Uh, and knowing that they might not be able to repay that favor, uh, might not be able to host you in that way. Well, and that's really, that's, that's a, a brief glimpse of grace, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, it's only truly doing something for somebody if they can't repay you, right? Yes. That's the notion of grace that sometimes um, gets a little muddied up, right, of what the definition of grace. But that's, that's one definition or at least one example of grace. And so um, I love that, how yeah. we, can, we can invite people. I love Peter Rollins right now, and so yeah. he talks about, oh, he's, he's a, like a deep and existential guy talks about okay. big concepts and everything, but uh, we like thinking binary terms, right? Yes. This way or that way. And I found myself on different ends of the spectrum on a lot of things, whether it's faith or politics or whatever it is. And Peter Rollins would make the, the argument that it's in the tension of dualistic thinking, right? It's in that tension, and not just dualistic, but of different viewpoints that we realize there is no one answer in life. There is, you know, there's, there's, there's no winning side as much as it is in the tension we find truth, and in the acknowledgement that there is no one solution, there is no one answer. Mm -hmm. um, kind of the messy middle, like yes. on your way to the answer, it's like that's where the growth happens, that's where all the community happens, all of that. Yeah, instead of I'm only going to hang out with, you know, um, conservative, Republican, you know, people of faith, mm -hmm. or progressive, you know, liberal, um, Buddha. I, I don't yeah. know, I'm just thinking, Isn't I'm throwing out... Those people just support your mindset. You never uh -huh. grow. You know, you don't have new perspectives to grow from. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that's the challenging part. Is like, you know, if I want a certain answer, then I'll go to that person because I know they'll reinforce my idea. Yeah, they'll affirm you. Yes. And that's why I think leaders. If you're a leader, everybody's a leader. But if you're a leader in your position at work or whatever else, do not surround yourself with yes people. <laughs> surround yourself with people who challenge you. Because if you surround yourself with yes people, you'll just have more self. And what is self? Self is ego, and all sin emerges from self and self. ego. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so Amy, what are people saying? So when you ask what does church mean to you or what do you like to see in a small group, Ashley said church is like family to me. I love our community. Mm -hmm. Chuck said the best I can do is compare it to college. Sunday morning is like the 300 person lecture hall, but things like table talk and small groups are the lab classes where I actually process that information and figure out how to make it. Ooh, easy. the hands on, the dirty work. I love yeah. it. That's I good love analogy. Those analogies. Yeah. yeah. That was really good. Yeah, and I went to like a really small university. I went to Central Methodist University, and I, I really enjoyed that. And so, like, our campus ministry did that. Like, I was part of a discipleship group that, you know, we would have 75 people at our worship experience on Tuesday. And then this small group of gals, we would meet every Monday night, and we sat at a table, we drank uh, tea, because I was the fancy Sure, it's your story, <laughs> tell how you want. Um, we really did drink tea. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but we would have the cycle. Long Island? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding, keep going, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hot tea, you know, with, with cream and sugar. And, right. Uh, but we grew, like, in that time, like, Yes, we could sing with everybody else in the 75, right. um, but it was around that table that I made connections that was lifelong, and they challenged me in my idea of who God is, um, and who I am, and how I'm living that out. Well, that's why teaching or lecturing or preaching, I mean, preaching's teaching, you know, that's why I believe that uh, at my job as a pastor is not to tell people the answer, yeah. but to, to show them to, to look beyond themselves, right? Because, again, I don't necessarily know if there's only one answer, right? There's, there's, it's in the tension. So the answers are when you say, I don't know the answers. I'll never have all the answers, right? It's in that truth that you realize that your mind, your consciousness is expanded. You know, all those things. And so, but then it's in the dialogue that that, you know, happens that your truth is different than your friend's truth. Mm -hmm. And, oh my gosh, how could that be, right? Yeah. That's, that's a paradigm shift, yes. right? And you have to, like, free yourself up for that to be in that uncomfortable space, but knowing that you will, you do have a grounding, like there is foundation below you, right. that even when you let go of that idea to think about somebody else's perspective mm -hmm. might be true itself, um, it's freeing because it opens up your, your blinders basically. Yeah, it's not true for you, but it's definitely true for them, right? Mm -hmm. Or it may not be true for you. Mm -hmm. And so truth, you know, I grew up in a church where it was truth and belief or there's some universal thing I'm like, really? The, I mean, the truths, the universal truths are goodness, kindness, grace, love. Right? These are universal truths. But what they look like, how they manifest, is completely different for me than it is for you, right? And so acknowledging that and helping or understanding that somebody else's truth, right, a person of a different color or of a different sex or a sexual orientation, whatever that is, um, should be enlightening to us then because we can then understand where they're coming from. Yes, absolutely. You become aware of how they interact with the world because you know their truth is different mm -hmm. or their perspective is different. And so that also helps you in how you interact with them on a daily basis um, and how you respond to how they, they said that's, that phrase or whatnot. Right. It's because it's coming from a different spot. Well, it just helps us to be more inclusive, you know, with these big banners up front at all of our churches that yeah. say included, accepted, and love. And um, you can't truly accept somebody if you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. So I always joke, if you work for the church, uh, we give assessments, you know, so we know we, we discover self and know who, who we are. Because I'm like, if you don't know who you are, the good and bad, mm -hmm. right? And then if we don't know the good and bad about each other... Like if I'm only loving the good parts of you, mm -hmm. the thing I the thing I see on social media, or whatever else, mm -hmm. well, that's not really love, acceptance, and inclusion. That's just I like some persona. Yeah. But if we know the good and the bad, mm -hmm. then I can love you wholly, right? Yes. And, and that's being fully seen, and that that's right. I talked about that the week before of, of how God truly sees us, and um, you know what does it feel like to be truly seen and to see others that way, um, and to see everybody. Other whole being. Yeah. yeah. I talked about that. Yeah, I did that last week too. And I just challenge people at, at, at our places of work. Often we see somebody else as competition or just a number or just another employee yeah. because we're just there to work, right? And it's not about relationship and everything else. And so I'm like, you know, um, I use a scripture where the woman comes in while Jesus is at a table, yep, right? It's one of my favorites. Washes his feet and, and Jesus is like, you know, do you see her? Simon, do you mm -hmm. see her? Right? And so, uh, which is beautiful because, of course, they don't. No. They see, uh, and I don't like to use the term that some people use, that they see a person with problems because we don't know what her problems were. Yeah. Um, often she gets labeled as certain things, but, we, you know, 
the point is, no, she's a human being. She's yes. a person. She is a child of God, however you want to describe that. And do you see her? And so I'm like, do you see the person sitting across the table from you, right? And, and we don't. And it takes the time to be intentional to slow down. And like, you know, when we're so busy and we're in meetings together and things, like we haven't had these intentional conversations. And right. Like, um, so it's taking that time to stop and really see that person and have conversations with them. You know, I'm learning so much about you right now. Like, <laughs> um, like I know things about you because I work with you, but at right. the same time, like, we're always in flux of everything. Well, every time we're in a meeting, it's go, 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 and we go to the next thing, right? Instead yeah. of actually having conversations and talking. So, Amy, anything else for us? Well, Chuck just said it's like those pictures, what you are just talking about. It's like those pictures when you turn them around and you see something totally differently. Mm -hmm. So he said, like, the old lady, young woman picture. Yes. Yeah, um, he said the world, life, etc., can all seem very different just based on each of our frames of reference. You're seeing those, um, it's like 3D, there's like, there'll be a, a stick and then a blanket and then like all these things in a row and when you're looking at it straight on, it's an image of something, oh, an yeah. elephant or, you know, uh -huh. something like that. But when you turn to the side, it's just random pieces. That made me think of that. Yeah. Just random yeah. pieces of random material. Uh-huh. And I'm like, that is the family of God. Like, that's the faith, our faith community is all these random things that come together that show an image, a good image, right, right of what I would say, if it's a good image, it's a godly image, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing we aspire to be or to be a part of. And so um, right. if I was more creative, I'd try to make something yeah. like that. I don't know. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Yeah, and that takes, like, in our own, like, communities, it takes you maybe driving a couple blocks farther than you normally do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I go between Kansas City, Raytown, and Lee Summit, most of my kind of circle. And so I see so many different areas in that. And I know they're having so many different life experiences mm -hmm. in that. And so it's just getting beyond your own circle and seeing what else is out there. Yeah, because we, um, we, we, you know, talk about white flight, all the different things that have happened uh, in, our, in our cultures and in our communities that we end up with segregation of groups of people, right, all over town. And, and, and it's, it's sad, but, yeah, shopping, you know. That's why I'm a big fan of, um, you know, put a quarter million dollar house, you know, like next to a fourplex. Like people with a quarter million dollar house, people don't like that yeah. <laughs> often. Uh -huh. But, um, <coughs> so sorry. You were joke when you were just talking. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> You're getting uh, so emotional there. <laughs> goodness, I'm so sorry. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one of those things where, um, I love these communities where you can work, shop, play, there's multifamily, there's bigger houses that, you know, because it encourages true community as compared to, um, we're going to, we're going to put all multifamily housing here and we're going to only, you know, that's going to be what used to be thought of as lower income. But now like it's a whole new generation of people. And anyway, I, I get excited when we yeah. talk about neighborhoods that are, like Mr. Rogers like, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been fun to like move in these like times of my life of like, I lived at the Lake of the Ozarks for a while and then here. And so again, it's changing your circle of what you view of life. And so, you know, there's different people there that I um, had relationships with and then come here and it's totally different, urban kind of different. Um, but it is coming again back to the table and having those intentional relationship building opportunities. Yeah. So how do we do that? What's the functional, how, how do we engage into that? Um, you know, it's, it's hard. You know, it's, I, I live, you know, I, I actually live in Lee Summit, but I'm Blue Springs School District, right? And so there's, um, and I live in a very affluent area. So like, what are the ways in which we can engage people who don't look like us and who don't, who just have different life experience, right? A different truth is another way to say that. So. How, how do we do that? Yeah, I think it, it takes a lot of intentional effort on our behalf. Um, so like during this time, I sit out on my porch a lot. So like if I see a neighbor out, like I make an intentional wave uh, to say hello, things like that. Um, I live like next to the, the back door where everybody comes in. So I have that opportunity to do that. Um, but other times it's um, when it's safe to do so, go outside of your normal circle. Um, mm -hmm. Go to that restaurant across town. Go go eat in a, a different establishment. Um, that person that sits um, a couple of seats different from you in, in church, mm -hmm. like you see them, but you don't really know them. So maybe invite them out to dinner after after church or small group. 
Um, and right now you can do it over Zoom. Um, my friend group, we, we meet up on Zoom, do trivia, things like that. Oh, I love trivia. Yeah. <laughs> Are you a trivial, trivial pursuit person? I did, but now seminary takes up too much of my time. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, so Abby's still in a uh, year, year and a I'm half. I'm in my third year, so I got a year and a half left. Yeah. Um, and while we're talking about engagement and um, community, I do want to, I, I know, I think all the emails are going out today about we're shifting worship to online. And so for those of you that haven't heard, I just, I think it'd be good to, for us the last couple minutes here to talk about how if we, um, because, because everybody's experience is valid, everybody's truth is valid. And, and so, um, you know, most of our people have re remained online and in a virtual format during this time. But with the new restrictions, and, and, and I'm going to acknowledge that if you don't know, new restrictions came out yesterday through Jackson County. And uh, Kansas City, Jackson County, there are several counties that came together and cities and announced it together. And churches were exempt from that order. And so I want to be very clear that, that we were exempt. However, um, there was a challenge given to us in leadership that we would still try to follow those same rules because... Um, I have lots of friends in the medical field. Hospitals are overrun right now. COVID units are 100% full, and they have now branched out into ER units and other floors. And so we are trying to slow the spread so that um, we can, you know, keep facilities. We don't want people to die ever. We especially don't want people to die from this because they can't get medical mm -hmm. attention. And so we um, started this Sunday. I don't know if you have you sent your email yet. I will after I, after here. Sorry, <laughs> you're good. Okay, uh, I just want to let people know we are we are moving to a, a, a hundred percent virtual again, and like I said, ninety percent of our people have. That's remained. the same with ours. Yeah. yeah, we had a handful, and honestly, a lot of it was because we were asking people to come serve, and so most people are here on a Sunday morning. You know, if there's forty or fifty people, we're serving, or you know, um, just doing all the things, helping out with children's ministry. So we are going to move back to virtual. Um, right now, we'll see if we're able to slow this down a little bit and see what happens. I know the schools in, anticipate this not getting better, and so like Blue Spring School, we've been in person. We are now moving. They have moved after Thanksgiving. We'll be virtual for the rest of this calendar year. Mm -hmm. And so I just I wanted to say that, get that out there, that we do value all life, everybody's experience, and we want everybody to be safe. And um, anyway, I just thought it would be a good time to announce that on here in case some people are watching however people will see this. So, Absolutely. Um, what else? What we got, about five minutes, yeah. four minutes, three minutes? <clears throat> yeah, I'd definitely say like that, that, that's, this time has been hard. And so like trying to find your community and, and keeping up with your community takes intention. Um, and so it does take that extra um, text message or phone call um, to reach out to those that you're already friends with and, and keep those connections um, and keep everyone safe and there's a lot of isolation happening right now, so it's hard. You know, I um, I'm in a lot of leadership positions around town and different organizations, and and we're all having the same conversations. You know, how what's the best way? And um, I just need everybody to know that I'm in support of this, and that we uh, we have to continue to find other like this is not going away. Right. If I were to anticipate, um, you know, I, I this is probably. Go back to history. Go look at the, the 1918 mm -hmm. pandemic. The second wave was by far exponentially the worst. And so I'm not doom and gloom. I'm just yeah. saying we need to be prepared for that and try to mid, you know, try to, to lessen that impact. And I'm going to be a part of that solution, not a part of that problem. Yeah. So um, we... Yeah, I've heard a lot from, like, medical staff. Like, I have a lot mm -hmm. of friends in the medical field, and they all say they're very exhausted. And so, like, this is a way that we're loving them and caring for them who have been on the little the literal front lines of this is to say, hey, we love you enough that we're going to take a pause to everything. Right. And, of course, uh, hopefully we have a vaccine coming. I know that's going to go to frontline workers first. We have uh, some people go to our daycare here that I think um, um, they're in the medical field. Her husband's a surgeon, so we were just talking the other day. They'll go to frontline workers. And then, like, I haven't been able to see my dad since uh, for almost this entire year, right? And because he's in assisted living, so then we'll go to, like, prioritization of that. But... Um, I hope that hope there's some that some sense of normalcy maybe next spring summer. Yeah. It's all you know that's all um, right. anticipation. It's all it's what I want. I know. I also want to say we don't make those decisions lightly. I am grieving this all over again, yes. and I know you just yes. opened back up a few weeks ago, and now it's back to this because I'm such an extra. 
doesn't matter if you're introvert or extrovert, you love people. Yeah. But even for me, like I do not like preaching to an empty room because I'm a people person. I feed on that energy, right? It's I, so I feel hard. it. It's yeah. so hard. Like, like uh, you're not used to like when we were really doing it, like I was doing it from my living room at one point and to where I was just preaching to myself on the screen. And so, <laughs> you know, it's just so weird to like, we love that personal connection that we're like having right. that conversation, even though it's really one-sided in the sermon. Um, but we know that we're connecting with people right. through that. Well, and we just become complete narcissists because we're literally talking to ourselves, right? That's what. Yeah. <laughs> Although we preach to ourselves every week, you feel that way? Yes. The a sermons lot of are, times, are aimed at me more than anybody, any week, anybody yeah. in the room. Yeah. I'm just like working this through. How does this apply to me, and and how might I share that with everybody right. else too? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're yeah. It's I don't know. Twenty nine. Anything else before we sign off today? No, Abby. This has been Send fun. us off. Well, thank you for coming out. <laughs> 30 minutes goes by like that, right? I know. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not that yeah, it is a little bit the same on Sunday mornings. but it's, yeah. <laughs> um, Well, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for all you do in the community. Actually, real quick. Talk about, so you guys do a meal. Mm-hmm. And I know you're big into dinner church and table church and all. So just for the last minute or so, talk about that a little bit, what yeah. you guys are doing in Raytown. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a ministry at Raytown called The Table. And so the kind of the vision behind that is that we kind of return to what Jesus did at the very beginning with the early church, was meeting at tables, having these real conversations about how God was in and and working in the world. And so because of the pandemic and everything, we um, pivoted from sitting down to to to-go meals. And so we've served um, just under 500 meals since September. Um, and so tomorrow night we have our Thanksgiving meal and we're serving turkey and the fixings. And so we're hoping to serve 175 tomorrow That's night. That's awesome. Um, but we do this on the first and third Wednesday of every month. And most of the people who have come through that line do not go to our church. They're people right. that we have connected and we've uh, reached out to. And we're making just like that drive through time that I get to say, hi, how are you doing? How many meals can we serve you? Um, and we're getting to know people that way as well um, and be able well, it's to a great ministry. Request, so. And if anybody who's watching this uh, over the next week or so, if you're interested in that, drop a comment or reach out to Abby. You can find her email address through our website or, a- or contact Amy or I. And we would love to get you guys connected mm-hmm. with that to help out and to be a part of that ministry. It's an yeah. amazing ministry and you've put yes. a lot of work in and you've done such a good job with it. So thank you for what you're doing in our community. Thank you. It's been an awesome uh, ministry and it takes a full team to do that. And um, we are so grateful for all of our volunteers that donate food, time, and, and energy. And when you guys come together, it's socially distanced, everywhere's mask, right? So yes. it's all safe. So, okay. Absolutely. Everybody's spread out, wearing masks. I don't let anybody in without a mask. <laughs> good. <laughs> we got to keep it safe. <laughs> well, thank you for joining Tabletop this week. Um, I appreciate all you do for our community. Thank you all for joining us, and um, I'll see you. Actually, I don't know if I'll see you next week, but. All right, peace. Bye. Bye.